you, um, good day students, um, I, we are back again to our advanced macroeconomics class, ECM 404. Uh, earlier, we examined um, the um, introduction to economic growth and development. My name is Mohammed, Dr. Mohammed Ali. So in this class, we are going to be looking at um, we are going to be looking at um, the theories of uh, economic growth and uh, development. As we have earlier examined the concept of economic growth and development, the distinction between growth and development, we have also looked at the measurement and determinants of economic growth and development. So we are going to be concentrating on the theories of economic growth and development. So at the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain the Rosto stages of growth theory, explain the Harodoma growth model, the new classical growth theory, the end genius growth theory, the Lewis theory of growth, and the new colonial dependence theory. We're going to start with the Rosto stages of growth theory. Rosto is an American historian, with full name Walt Wiltman Rosto, who advocated for five stages of growth. According to Rostro, the transition from underdevelopment to development can be described in terms of five stages through which all countries must pass. The first stage is the traditional society. This is a society that is characterized by economic decision making on the basis of custom, tradition, and obligation. In this stage, this Society depends on the basic custom and tradition. Here, it is still a crude society. Then the next stage of the growth process is the precondition for takeoff. This is characterized by advances in agriculture and abandoning of own economic culture as well as emergence of the entrepreneurial class. This is a stage where there is certain level of advancement, particularly in the method of production and distribution. Then we have the takeoff stage. Here, the takeoff stage is characterized by increasing rate of saving, emergence of leading sector, which helps to pull along other sectors contributing, therefore, to the realization of sustained growth. In this stage, there is the leading sector will emerge, and this leading sector will pull the other sectors. And there is even there is also accumulation of saving, which will, of course, lead to more investment. Then we have the next stage, which is the drive to maturity. This is the stage of industrial revolution, where the other sectors catch up with the leading sector. Remember, in the, in the takeoff stage, there is a leading sector. So here, the other sectors, the leading sector pulls the other sectors, and then here, the, the stage of drive to maturity, other sectors will catch up with the leading sector. The stage of high mass, then we have the stage of high mass consumption. At this stage, the economy is deemed to have matured, making it possible for the, for the citizen to enjoy appreciable levels of living standard. In this stage, there is high level, the, the choice of what to consume is high, and the consumption is well sophisticated. It's, this is the stage where most developed economies are, where what they consume is well sophisticated. They use a lot of gadgets. They use advanced uh, method of production, and they also use, um, even in their household consumption, they use um, clean energy in cooking, in their cooking uh, activities. So well, we, the, 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 these are the five stages which Rostow has uh, explained to be in the stages that all nations must pass through in their, in their trajectory of uh, growth and development. Um, from the explanation, it is obvious that the second and third stage are probably uh, more relevant to the growth and development of the emerging nascent economy as it is. In that stage, the resistance to change in traditional values and institutions is finally overcome, and modern industries begin to emerge. Away from that, we have the Harodoma growth theory. The Harodoma growth theory is a uh, growth theory advanced by two economists. Sir Roy Harrod of Britain and F.C. Doma of USC, each working independently of the other. A key objective of the HD model is to overcome
overcome the limitation which they have found to be inherent in the nature of simple Keyesian model. The Keyesian model explains net investment as playing only one role, which is that it is a component of aggregate demand. The Keyesian model, investment is only seen as a component of aggregate demand. However, the HD model emphasized that net investment has dual role. One of them is that it is a component of aggregate demand as explained by the Keyesian model or the Keyesian uh, school. And then it is, it is also an addition to the stock of productive resources. So investment plays two rules, one being the demand and then one, the other one being the supply effect. Does investment have both demand and supply effect? For example, building and, building and equipment a new uh, uh, building and equipping a new uh, factory generates a demand for cement, steel, machinery, etc. And the factory, once built and equipped, increases the economy's productive capacity. Thus, the economy's net investment in any period has dual effect. So, the Harrodoma uh, group theory has a, a set of uh, assumptions. One of them is that there is no external sector, that the economy is a closed economy. The other one that there is homogeneity of labor that grows at constant natural rate, that, that meaning that labor in the economy is homogeneous. The skill, the productivity level of all the, the what constitutes labor supply in the economy is the same across board. And there are only two factor input, labor and capital, with absence of technical problem. Then the other assumption is that a fixed proportion of income is saved. The fifth one is that equal proportions of labor and capital are used in production. Thus, the production function is the relative type, L-shaped isoprene. The Harrodoma uh, growth model emphasizes that an economy's growth depends directly on the national net savings rate and inversely on the national capital output ratio. It means that for every economy to grow, it must save a certain proportion of its national income and must ensure that there is new investment representing new addition to capital stock with lower capital output ratio. The capital output ratio means how much and quality of resources needed to produce a certain output. So the conclusion of the HD model is expressed in the following equation. You have the equation there that, uh, uh, that uh, looks at the conclusion of the HD model. The left-hand side of the equation, this side looks at uh, 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 represent the rate of growth of GDP, and then the right-hand side is the net national savings ratio, and C is the capital output ratio. The policy implication ratio, the HD model, is that the growth rate of the economy can be influenced by policymakers by designing policies to reduce the capital output ratio, say, by investing in human capital and ensuring application of better technology, while influencing increase in the rate of saving and investment. That takes us to the new classical growth model. This growth model attempted to correct the major defects of the Harold Dommer growth model. Developed by Robert Solow and Trevor Swan in 1956, the defect they recognize in the HD model is that it is based on the Leontief type production function, which is characterized by fixed capital labor proportion. This fixity eliminates the possibility of increasing output by increasing the supply of one factor alone. Then, if you want to produce, there must, the, 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 uh, the Harrodoma growth model sees, it explains that this, it is a certain proportion of labor and capital must be used in production. But the neoclassical growth model makes the growth process to be more flexible in that, no, there can be changes in the proportion of both factors that you can decide to increase capital and then reduce labor in order to improve your productivity. So it is this defect inherent in the HD model that the neoclassical growth model proceeded to redress. In doing this, the assumption of a leotif type production function was dropped and replaced by a more realistic produ production function characterized by well-behaved negatively sloping isoprene. This production function was considered more realistic as it recognized the possibility of factor substitution. So the neoclassical growth model is presented here where 
uh, economic growth is dependent on what? Uh, um, um, labor force. The, the, we have labor force represented by L. Then we have a stock of capital represented by K. And then technological change. The traditional neoclassical growth model of Solo and Swan explains the output of an economy grows in response to larger input of physical capital and labor. It is however assumed that an economy under this model obeys the law of diminishing returns to scale. So the model therefore hypothesizes that as the capital stock increases, the economy's growth rate decreases. And in order to sustain the growth process of the economy, the economy must take advantage of technological innovations and development. So because there is the likelihood of diminishing return to scale by the use of labor and capital, it is only technology that will now come in and ensure the sustainability of the growth. The solo and swan trees technology has exogenously determined outside the system. That is, technology is determined outside, technology to them is determined outside this system, this model. It is outside this model that technology is uh, determined. So the growth, the, the growth, the growth theory neglects the role of your human, uh, human capital. So, there is a comparison of Haroldoma uh, and neoclassical growth theory. Why the production function implicitly in the Haroldoma model contains only one factor, that is capital. The neoclassical growth model assumes a multi-factor production function that includes capital, labor, and technology. In the Haroldoma, uh, another comparison is that in the Haroldoma, uh, in the Haroldoma growth model, labor and capital are deemed to be perfect complement of one another. Whereas in the neoclassical model, capital and labor are assumed to be substitute for one another. Also, in the Haradoma model, it assumes a constant capital output ratio. The neoclassical model assumes a variable capital output coefficient. Incidentally, incidentally, both models assume that capital and labor are subject to the law of diminishing marginality. So these are the comparisons of the model. That takes us to the endogenous growth model. Recall that in our explanation of the neoclassical growth model, we did say that the growth model of the neoclassical, uh, neoclassical economy, or the neoclassical growth model, assumes that the technology is exogenously determined. This is determined outside the system. So it is the dependence of growth on exogenous technological progress in the neoclassical growth model led to the renewal of search for alternative models that can generate economic growth endogenously. So the major component of the model, the major proponents of this uh, endogenous growth model are Roma, uh, Lucas, Grossman, and Hepburn. To them, technological advancement are consequences of research and development effort by the human capital. That is quality of labor force in the model. In their model, an economy will continue to grow as long as it does not run out of ideas. This implies that it is the interaction of physical capital, labor supply, and technology due to research and development that brings about economic growth. So, Technology is not determined outside the system as explained by the neoclassical uh, uh, growth model. To them, technology is driven, could be driven by labor. And, and if technology could be driven by labor, it, the technology also, uh, the labor also could even drive the, the um, uh, capital. So it is the, 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 the it, it looks at the growth model from the point of view of, of, view of that. If you want to develop technology, then you could develop the human capital. Then by de developing the human capital, technology will be developed. So to them, the technology is endogenous within the system. This means that human capital is needed for growth. With skilled manpower, there will be efficiency in the use and enhancement of capital and technology, which will result in increase in marginal productivity of labor. Thus, enhanced human capacity, which the neoclassical model neglected, will rather lead to a shift in the production function and thus leading to increasing returns to scale rather than decreasing growth rate. Therefore, technology and human capital are determined inside the system, that is, they are endogenous uh, uh, to the system. 
that takes us to the Lewis uh, uh, growth, uh, theory of growth, the theoretical model that focuses on the structural transformation of a primary, of a primary subsistence economy, was formulated by the Nobel, Nobel laureate uh, at Lewis in the mid 1950s. The Lewis two sector model became the general theory of development process in surplus labor developing nations during most of the 1960s and, and early 1970s. The theory assumes that in developing countries, there is surplus labor, much labor supply in the rural sector. So what the theory advocates is that, that, an, uh, that uh, an underdeveloped economy has two sectors, the traditional agricultural sector with surplus labor and the modern industrial sector with high productivity. So Lewis postulated that the surplus labor in the underdeveloped economy with, in the developed economy with traditional uh, tra with traditional overpopulated rural subsistence sector has a very low marginal product. And it's, if it has low marginal product, it is whenever the, so to them, to the, to the, to Lewis, it, when the, and when there is advancement of the modern sector, that is the capitalist sector, the labor, the surplus labor in the, in the, in, in the, in the subsistence sector will be drawn into the uh, modern sector. And by doing that, the output of the modern sector is, the, is improved, and then the, the productivity of labor also in the rural area is also improved because the price of labor now in the rural area becomes enhanced. So in doing that, there, is, there will be general improvement in the, in the economy. So it focuses on development of the modern sector. So one of the criticism of this theory is that it neglects the it neglect agricultural uh, rural uh, economy and possibility of capital flight from even the modern sector. That as the modern sector, if it's focused on the modern sector, as the modern sector develops, it is possible that the capital that is being generated may not be reinvested in the modern sector or in the modern domestic economy. It is possible that it is taken outside the economy and invested in, in, the, in the other economy of the world. So, that takes us to the neocolonial dependence theory. This was developed by new Marxist thinkers. The theory explained the reason why the less developed countries, LDC, will remain where they are is due to their being constantly dominated by the developed countries in international affairs. A situation in which the rich countries have much power than the poor ones in decision that affect important international economic issues such as price of agricultural products and raw materials. You find in the current world, for example, a situation whereby there is much dependence on the advanced countries of the world, much dependence on them in terms of ideas, dependence on them in terms of how the institutions of less developed countries should be run, dependence of them in terms of their, their their technique of production, dependence of them, even in terms of education, depend on their own system. But this shouldn't, this is the, the, the new colonial dependence theory explanation. It is the reason why underdeveloped countries still remain underdeveloped. Because the, the relationship manifests itself in the international trade. It's also manifesting itself where a situation whereby what less developed countries continue to produce are primary products. And that is what they export. And when you produce primary product and export primary product, you get lesser compared to manufactured product. And your production of primary product depends on the demand from uh, industrial uh, and, and developed economies. So it makes you to continue to depend on them. So the main proposition of this model is that the existence of underdevelopment, which is an economic situation characterized by persistent low levels of living or multidimensional poverty, in developing countries is due to their continued reliance on developed countries, on developed uh, countries' policies or system in various spheres, like economic, political system, education system, technological adoption, and attitude, ETC, to stimulate their own economic development. That we, the, the over-reliance on developed countries to stimulate um, the domestic economy of LDCs is one of the bane to their economic development. And it is a major pain to their economic development. That reliance could be in terms of economic
economy, maybe reliance on them for resources, for example, rely a lot on developed economies to, to for, 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 for foreign savings or in form of debt to mobilize a domestic uh, economy. And then we also rely on them in terms of their political system, what they define as democracy. We have not developed our own democracy to suit our own system. Then our educational system also is not developed in a manner that to suit certain elements of our culture. And this, and then even our, the technology being adopted, some of them may not be suitable to our own climate. And all these are major things, major issues that uh, affect uh, the development of a uh, uh, less developed economy. So the dependence and dominance is facilitated by certain elite or comprado groups in developing countries. So it's not, it's, they, they just come. There are certain elites within developing economies that facilitate this. And the activities result in perpetuation of international capitalist system of inequality and conformity as they are rewarded. The elites are rewarded directly or indirectly for this, sometimes through the multinational corporation and multilateral assistance organization like the World Bank or International Monetary Fund. On the whole, the model explained that it is industrial capitalist countries' policies that continue to fund the embers of underdevelopment in developing countries. Therefore, underdevelopment is a consequence and a particular form of capitalist development in which the economies of one group of countries are conditioned by the development and growth of others. So this is the explanation of uh, the, 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 the neocolonial uh, dependence uh, theory of uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, we have been able to examine the various theories of growth, starting from uh, the, the growth to stages of growth, which explain that um, growth, the growth process of every economy is in terms of five stages. Then we also look at the, the Harold Domer growth model that explains that an economy growth depend directly on the national net savings rate and inversely on the national capital output ratio. We also looked at uh, the economic growth as explained by the neoclassical uh, growth model, which uh, uh, look at growth as being influenced by three factors, capital, labor, and technology. The economy must take advantage of technology, technological innovation, in order to sustain the growth process, as the theory assumes the possibility of diminishing uh, returns. Thus, the theory treats technology as exogenously determined outside the system.